So we're privileged uh, to be able to come back to some kind of in-person events. Uh, we're hoping to have many more of these. Very soon, expect to be invited to our uh, inauguration of the new library and research center. So we're ready to uh, inaugurate soon, so we will be inviting the community that we aim to serve. By the way, للي متكلمين بالعربي كل شيء راح يكون اليوم بالانجليزي لكن في ترجمه ففي فيكم تاخذوا هات ست من ورا والترجمه متاحه على كل فقرات هذا البرنامج. Uh, the reason that we have the event today is that we are privileged to have Dan Brown with us. Dan is here teaching in our Master of Religion program. Uh, so this is part of the residency that happens in the middle of the module, which is mostly online. So Daniel has written a very key textbook for Islam, which is called The New Introduction to Islam, which has been translated to Arabic by Dar Manhal al-Hayat in partnership with ABTS. So we're grateful to have this double event. We're going to have a lecture, and then we're going to have a book launch of the new introduction to Islam in Arabic. So welcome, and uh, Case Vanderknife, who's uh, on our faculty, is going to come now and introduce our speaker. Good evening. It's my honor to introduce to you our main speaker for, for tonight, Dr. Daniel Brown. Dan lives in Turkey since 2012 with his wife, Carol where he founded and leads the Institutes for the Study of Religion in the Middle East. And as Ali already said, he's the author of a number of books on Islam. Over the past six years, uh, I think, Dan has been involved with ABTS mainly in the Master of Religion that focuses on the MENA region, teaching the course on Islam, and he's now for two weeks with us for the residency. I thought uh, I could do two things, list all the things he did, or just give a personal impression that I got over the past week of how Dan works at ABTS. I think the second option would be nicer. So every morning, even though he has, is teaching for two full weeks, Dan arrives with a smile on his face. He seems completely relaxed. He switches effortlessly between high-class lectures, deep and warm devotionals, and a serious interest in the life, lives of his students. And I was reminded several times this week of his humility. I will mention only two examples. I, when I was walking along the students, one of them said, we know he is a world-class scholar, but he is just so normal. And then the second example, Dan moved so naturally among his students that it took us some serious conversation to convince one of the staff members of ABTS that he was a teacher in this course and not one of the students. Dan's lecture for tonight will be titled if I were you, the challenge of studying my neighbor's faith. Then we are honored to have you and learn from you. Please join me in a warm applause. Thank you very much, Kes. I'm not sure that I recognize myself in this introduction, but I appreciate your kindness. I'd like to begin tonight's lecture with a thought experiment. And this thought experiment will require a little bit of setup, as experiments often do. So for the sake of this thought experiment, you should think of me as old Daniel. This is to distinguish me from young Daniel, who will be introduced later to you. And also for the sake of this thought experiment, we will place old Daniel in three different positions. When old Daniel is here, he will be playing the part of a student of comparative religion. So you can think of this as position one, comparative religion. When old Daniel returns to the center, he'll be playing the part of a Protestant Christian. 
Uh, and this will be easy for you to remember because I'm standing behind a pulpit that's used by Protestant Christians. If I'm standing over here, old Daniel will be playing the part of a student of Islam, and especially a student of the history of Islam. So history of Islam, Protestant Christian, comparative religion. Easy to understand, right? Thank you. So we'll begin with old Daniel here in this spot, but first a little bit of a note about each of these positions, and maybe first of all, the middle one. When I take the place of a Protestant Christian, I'm not just a generic Protestant Christian. There is no such thing. I am a Protestant Christian who occupies a particular place, has a particular set of experiences, uh, and has been shaped in a particular way. Uh, so I'm part of a tradition within Protestant Christianity, but there are other traditions. And I could say, more specifically, that I grew up in a Baptist household. I'm sure that makes some people here happy. And that I have tended later in the direction of Reformed theology, that over time the Reformed theology has gotten a little bit smaller, right, in comparison with some other things, but it's still there, as my students probably hear every once in a while. Uh, so that's to make the point that here I'm not some sort of a generalized Protestant, I'm a specific one occupying a specific place, and when I'm a scholar of Islam, I'm not just a generic scholar of Islam. I have read particular things, studied with particular people. I'm part of a tradition. And similarly, of course, with the position of comparative religion. And so let's think of each of these places as a tradition. I'm part of a tradition, but in that tradition, I have a particular perspective, or we could call it a mindset. So we have traditions, and we have individuals with particular mindsets or perspectives within those traditions. So with that as background, let's begin our experiment. And our experiment begins with old Daniel in position one as a scholar or a student of comparative religion. Now, old Daniel is looking for a research project. And he's a little short on data, and he's also short on time. And so he decides that he will study someone that he knows quite well, an individual, young Daniel. Young Daniel, of course, is a perfect uh, subject for old Daniel's research because the data is quite accessible to him. You know, it's easy for him to gain data about young Daniel. He can just remember or try to remember what young Daniel was like. So the first project begins in 1974. Young Daniel is 11 years old. He lives in northern Pakistan. He's in a boarding school in northern Pakistan. And this boarding school, within this boarding school, young Daniel is part of an intensely evangelical Protestant community. Now, what old Daniel wants to do, he's going to be a little bit more specific. He wants to understand young Daniel's religious ideas about a particular topic he's going to choose the topic of holiness. He under, wants to understand what young Daniel believes about holiness. And so he goes back in time. He interviews, you could say, young Daniel. He tries to probe what was going on in his mind. He has wonderful access because, of course, he can access some of his thoughts that were never expressed. And he can observe the way that he behaved. And he's going to ask the question, what does young Daniel believe about the topic of holiness? This, by the way, is an interesting and important topic within the study of comparative religion. It's, it's something that has actually motivated some of the most interesting books in the history of religion. Rudolf Otto, for example, but many others. So what is he going to find? What conclusions will he draw, old Daniel, about young Daniel? Well, the first thing that he might notice is that at 11 years old, not surprisingly, young Daniel is not particularly articulate about his re religious beliefs, about holiness. He doesn't really know very much about what he believes. He, he may believe some things, 
uh, but it's kind of vague. So he's vague and inarticulate. But there will be no question that for young Daniel at this age, holiness is very closely connected with the person of Jesus. If he thinks of holiness, he thinks of Jesus. And if he thinks of Jesus, if someone asked him who is holy, Jesus would come to mind. The other thing that we could say with certainty is that the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus is associated in his mind with holiness. He actually remembers at night in boarding school alone, quoting verses from the Sermon on the Mount in his head. Sadly, mostly in relation to other people who he perceived as violating the Sermon on the Mount. So using it perhaps as condemnation or justification. But nevertheless, it's very clear that holiness, the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus are very closely connected with one another. Beyond this, I think we could probably say that there's a general idea of moral purity that goes with the idea of holiness for him. He knows that to be holy is to be morally pure, to be like Jesus, to act like the Sermon on the Mount. But notice for a moment, these are important things, notice for a moment what's missing. There's nothing about holy people beyond Jesus, holy places, holy objects. Now, maybe I should have said at the beginning of this, I'm talking about particular traditions. We could probably find people here or people who are listening who would occupy other traditions, even within Christianity. We could put a Roman Catholic position, or maybe more specifically, say, a Franciscan position or a Dominican position in here. And then, if that was articulated, the childhood of that person would probably be filled with holy people, saints, holy places, holy objects, icons, for example. And so the conception of holiness would be utterly different if we were to put someone other than me here. Right? My conception was shaped by my particular background. Okay, so we have old Daniel studying young Daniel in this position. He's come to certain conclusions. The usefulness of this exercise, one of them, is that we can also go forward in time. So let's add five years. Young Daniel is now, what, 16 years old, 17, six, something like that. He's 16 years old, 1979. What's changed? Well, we could say immediately that ideas uh, of the fearfulness of holiness, the sort of fear and trembling, maybe you could say, have been added to this conception of holiness, he's been exposed to more of the Old Testament. Right? And the Old Testament will maybe help him to add ideas about the wrath of God and a sense that holiness involves danger. And the call to holiness involving a call to moral purity represented by Jesus or the Sermon on the Mount then puts him in a very difficult position because it's very clear that he is not morally pure, that he does not meet this standard, and yet to fail to be morally pure before a holy God creates a problem. At this stage, of course, he's already been introduced to a solution within the Christian tradition to this problem in the form of Jesus, the perfect holy one, who will absorb his moral impurity and take it on himself and provide a shield, if you will, for the wrath of God and the danger that moral impurity and that holiness presents to him. So some things have changed, some things have developed. Okay, at this point, we can pause and take stock of some of the things that we may have learned. Okay, we've learned through this exercise that young Daniel's ideas about holiness about any kind of religious idea are actually pretty hard to get at. They're inaccessible. Even to him, he doesn't really understand or articulate very well. So that's one of the things that we have very clearly learned. We've also learned that they're constantly changing. They're in flux all the time. They're being shaped 
by other forces around him and other ideas around him over time. So there's an inaccessibility about them. There's a constant change about them. And then here's the other thing that will become very important to notice, and that is that when we take any particular religious idea that we're interrogating him about, that we're asking him about, it will be interconnected with a web of other ideas that are all connected with one another. So you remember, holiness connected to Jesus, connected to the Sermon on the Mount, connected to the wrath of God, connected to all of these other things, moral purity or impurity, that then shape how he understands the idea of holiness. And you can't just take the idea of holiness for him out of these things and say, try and treat it as something separate and abstract. It's connected to a web of ideas. Let's pause there, step out of the experiment for a second, and say, okay, here, here's what I've tried to do. I've tried to figure out what young Daniel, myself, in a younger form, actually believed, right, at different stages of my life. I've I've tried to understand my own faith, and I have found it difficult. There are huge challenges to understanding my own faith. Do I really understand what I believe, even right now, right? And, And do I understand how the influences on it? Am I aware of these kinds of things? If it is so hard to understand my own faith, how much harder to understand anybody else's, especially someone very different from me? The same challenges will apply, but they'll be much more severe. When I ask about my own faith, I at least have some access to my own thoughts and feelings, however inarticulate, I don't have access to yours. I don't know what you think. I don't know what you feel. I don't, and you may not either. So even when you express it to me, it may be in terms that you're not really sure of or that you're framing because you think I want to hear what you're saying. It's really difficult to get at what someone really believes, really difficult to understand it, really difficult to study it how much more across religious boundaries. So this begins to give us an idea of the challenge that we're up against. So we come to this point and we say, old Daniel is getting discouraged. You know, is he wasting his time on this lecture, on this attempt to understand? And so we say, well, to cheer him up, let's send him over to be a Protestant Christian. We'll move his position. We'll see see if that's better for him. As a Protestant Christian, old Daniel actually has more resources at his disposal now, right? Because he's read a lot, right? Well, we hope he has. You know, he's had a chance to read on this theme of holiness. He's read St. Augustine. He's he's read Luther. You know, he's he's read R.C. Sproul, you know, one of the great classics of Reform thinking on holiness, which will really, you know, stir your blood if you're wanting a, you know, sort of wrathful God picture. So he's re- he's read a lot. He has a lot more resources. And as a Protestant Christian in this particular position, who occasionally is even called upon to preach, he has ideas about what is right and what is wrong about these about holiness. You know, there are right views of holiness. There are wrong views of holiness. So, for example. He can probably get into a nice argument with a Roman Catholic friend about whether there are really, you know, holy people other than Jesus. In fact, if I can break out of the experiment for a second, I had a wonderful experience of going to a conference run by Dominicans on the theme of holiness. And one of the fun things that I got to do as a Protestant was to critique their ideas of holiness, you know. And to stand up and in very a very good-humored way, I hope, say, well, this is what a Protestant might say to what everything that has been said here. One of the things that I said was, isn't it strange in this conference on holiness in which there are Roman Catholics and there are Muslims involved and I as a Protestant, that the only people who have talked about Jesus in relation to holiness are the Muslims, right? 
They were. The Dominicans didn't mention Jesus once in the whole discussion. It was quite amusing to me. But you see, as a Protestant Christian, I can say those kinds of things, and I can critique, and I can say, well, you know, are there really holy objects? Are there really holy places? No, there's only one that's holy, and that's Jesus. And I can take a nice, firm Protestant perspective, and I can even critique young Daniel. I can look back and laugh good-naturedly at his naive ideas about holiness and be so glad that old Daniel has had a chance to correct them, having read good theology. Right? So this is, this is wonderful. You know, I'm far more confident. Has it helped me at all to understand my neighbor's faith? Not really. In fact, I might be in worse shape than I was before, because as you see, I've grown confident in a particular position, but it hasn't necessarily made me better at listening or understanding somebody else who differs. It's made me better at critiquing them. Might not be particularly helpful. So again, old Daniel comes away a little bit frustrated in this situation. Have we made any progress at all and so he decides that he will take refuge in his work. And he trudges over to position number three as a student of Islamic history. You know, because at least he can retreat to the things that he knows best. And he has, after all, written a textbook. And so some people imagine that he actually knows something about this. Sometimes he even thinks he knows something himself and, you know, his less... Know, reflective moments, right? So, so I'm here, but let's notice that something changes when I take this position in terms of how I approach the subject. When I was over there, I was talking about indiv an individual, individual data, a person, right? And, so, uh, and that, that's natural, actually, for someone in the field of comparative religion, taking a phenomenal, phenomenological approach, right? You're interested in the, you know, trying to figure out what this actually means maybe for this person in this context. But here, what I'm really interested in is a tradition, the whole tradition of Islam, in which individuals participate, but which is, in a sense, something bigger, an abstraction. Let me... Picture it this way for you with a story. When I was young at the boarding school that I mentioned, our uh, boarding parents, our staff members of the school, used to occasionally take us on camping trips. And one of the favorite places to take us, this was in northern Pakistan, was to the Indus River. Now, the Indus River, especially in the north, is, runs very fast. There, there are wonderful rapids. So we would camp on a particular island, a fairly large island, on the, in the middle of the Indus River, uh, with a rapid stream on either side. One of our favorite activities was to go tubing, that is, to ride the rapids on inner tubes. And so what we would do is go up to the top of the island and right on an inner tube in these rapids, hoping that we would be able to stop at the end of the island and get out and go back and do it again. Of course, always with the very exciting danger that we might miss it altogether and be lost somewhere down the river. Now, as I look back, I think, what were the adults thinking to let us do this? You know, what were they thinking? But that's not the subject of the lecture. You know, we can cr critique the adults there later. The point is that the person riding down that river on the inner tube, you can think of as the individual believer. And the river as the tradition in which they are participating. They are on that river for a very short span of time. And we can maybe be very interested in their ideas and their thoughts and uh, during that time that they're on the river. But what I'm doing here as a scholar of history and the history of Islam 
is trying to draw a map of the whole river from beginning to end or to present. So I'm not going to be focused on any particular participant in that tradition. I'll be trying to map the whole course of the river, its whirlpools, its rapids, its calm places. All of it will be part of what I'm trying to describe about the history of Islam and the history of the Islamic tradition. Now, that person on the inner tube that I point out may make a contribution to the tradition, but a lot of what they are experiencing, they're just inheriting from the past. And they may be quite unaware of a lot of those things. There may be things upstream in the tradition that happened long ago that they never become aware of, but that nevertheless have an indirect impact on them because they have shaped how the tradition developed over time. So let's say in this position, I ask the question, what is holiness in Islam? How would I go about studying holiness in this way? Not about a particular individual, but about a tradition as a whole. Well, I'll just give you some rough ideas of how one might go about it. Right, of course, since we're in the field of Islamic studies and there is in the, in the discipline of Islamic studies, there's kind of a Bible to that discipline called the Encyclopedia of Islam. That's probably where I'd begin, right? I'd, I'd begin by reading articles in the Encyclopedia of Islam that might give me guidance. But it would not be very long. By the way, this is indirect advice to my students here. This is where you start. Right? It wouldn't be very long before I would realize there's something I need to read here. It's a work by a man named Edvard West Westermark called The Moorish Conception of Holiness. I think that's the correct title. It, it, it was later republished in a larger work called Ritual and Belief in Morocco. And it turns out that this particular work is foundational to how holiness has come to be understood by scholars of Islam. And Edward West Westermark, who was a pioneering scholar, made the equivalence holiness equals barakah in Moroccan Islam. The idea of barakah and the idea of holiness he treated as more or less equivalent. And so from then on, of course, for people who were studying Islam, the idea of barakah would be, come to be linked with the idea of holiness. If you wanted to study holiness in Islam, you looked at the idea of barakah. And when Edward Westermark looked at Moroccan Islam, he saw barakah everywhere, right? Because he saw it in people, right? People were a source of barakah. First of all, the prophet of Islam, Muhammad, was a source of barakah and anything related to him, including his descendants. Saints are a source of barakah. Children are a source of barakah. But barakah can also be connected with places, especially places that have to do with saints. So a saint's tomb will be a source of barakah. Barakah can be something that's transmitted, right? he found, in popular Moroccan belief. And so he studies this whole range of practices and ideas that are connected with baraka in very much the same way that I over here was thinking about a whole range of ideas that in my experience might be con connected with the idea of holiness. And he gives us actually in some ways a wonderful gift of a very interesting partially anthropological study of the one particular concept within Moroccan Islam. Now you say, well, that's Moroccan Islam. But in fact, then, if you look more broadly, you'll find cognates to this, you'll find comparisons to this in Pakistani Islam or North Indian, in Indonesian Islam, in Turkish Islam. The same idea actually turns out to be extremely important 
and widely distributed. So, have we solved our problem then? I asked the question, what is holiness? Now I have an answer, right? I could, using the particular methods of Islamic studies, map out in a lot more detail than I would do tonight, more detail than Edward Westermark did, a treatise on the idea of holiness in the Islamic tradition. Right? Then I could start early, and I could go through various manifestations, and I could study different concepts that are connected, and I could come up with a sort of a, a map, if you will, of one small part of this river, the tradition of Islam. Would I be closer to understanding my neighbor's faith? Would I be closer to understanding what my neighbor, my Muslim neighbor, thinks about holiness? Unfortunately not. Sorry to continue to discourage you. But let's imagine this. I write this treatise. It's quite possible that my Muslim neighbor reads my treatise and says, that's not my faith. That's not what I believe. Quite possible, right? He's part of this tradition, but he doesn't have to accept these parts of the tradition that I'm describing for him. He doesn't have to allow me to define where he stands within the tradition. So have I understood his faith? Quite possibly, I have not understood his faith. In fact, maybe I've just created an abstraction that seems of very little relevance to him at all, even if for myself, and maybe for other scholars of Islamic studies, I seem to have brought clarity to this idea. It may not be particularly relevant to him at all. The other thing that we can note is that the idea of baraka and the idea of holiness may not actually be closely related at all, right? Or they may be only a relationship of resemblance. Remember, each of them is embedded in a conceptual web, if you will, of other ideas. Can we take one idea out and put it over here and study it? Maybe not, right? So, so we might have been on the wrong track altogether. Edward Westermark might have taken us on the wrong track in order to compare holiness and baraka. And we could go further and say, is baraka in Moroccan Islam? the same as baraka in Indonesian Islam? Quite possibly not, right? We would have to study in a lot more detail, in a lot more granular detail about the particular context, the particular sociology, the particular ideas that were connected with it in these particular contexts and how they were related to one another. So for these reasons, at least, I don't think we've really moved any closer in our understanding. The challenges that we've arrived at for understanding our neighbor's faith are formidable. They're huge. Should we just give up? But there's the problem of inaccessibility, right? The, the difficulty of getting at the data that often matters most to us, that is the internal world of the believer. It's really difficult to get at. We have the problem of how intertwined any religious idea is with someone's particular community, history, uh, sociological context. We have the problem of the way that ideas within the Islamic tradition and even within someone's own experience are constantly changing, the problem of constant change and constant difference. And we have the problem of the way that each concept is connected with other concepts in a way that makes it really hard to compare them. Is it worth it? I think it absolutely is worth it. And I think it's worth it because if you look back at the things that we have learned even with this short exercise, if you look at the things we've learned, it's enormously helpful in challenging us 
about the difficulty and also the opportunities that we have in exploring a neighbor's faith. First of all, we can look at each of these negatively, but we can also look at them positively. My neighbor's faith has depths far beyond what they might even realize and certainly what I realize. That presents an opportunity. Every person here, every person that we meet has depths to them in terms of their internal world, internal belief system that invites connection and exploration. Faith is deeply intertwined with family, with community, with personal history, even with trauma. And that intertwining of faith with these other things again presents us with a wonderful opportunity. Each individual is participating in a tradition that's inherited, but that she, he or she may only be vaguely conscious of. They may be, have difficulty articulating their place in it, but nevertheless, they do have a place in it, and their, their experience will be part of a window into that tradition. And then finally, the believer's conceptual universe is made up of a complete web of intertwined ideas. You can't just import a concept from outside and expect a direct translation. So is it worth it? It's worth it because the effort of exploration and translation makes it one of the most challenging journeys there can be. To actually try to actually explore someone else's faith with sensitivity, with determination, requires all of the empathy, all of the humility, and all of the love that we can muster. And that, if we can do it, makes it worthwhile. Because at minimum of the effect that it will have on us in helping us to develop greater empathy and greater humility and greater love. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Brown. I don't know about you, but every time I attend a conference like this, I feel more humbled, but also a bit more frustrated. Um, if you love books like I do, you realize that there are so many good things that we should be reading, that we should allocate time to so that we read them. And when you look at the offer out there, you realize it's impossible to keep up with the pace. You know, I envy those who post on social media at the end of the year the list of books that they have read. I have a friend like this from university. Last year, I did start, decided to unfollow him. Um, I know that a lot of us here have an ambitious reading plan for the year. And I hope that the, the book, New Introduction to Islam, is one of these books on your list. As a Christian publishing house, our mission is to equip the church, proclaim Christ, and encourage gospel-shaped living amongst Arab communities through Christian and educational resources. And part of the equipping is our academic textbook track that we've started a few years ago in partnership with ABTS. And one of the fruits or the outcomes of that track is uh, the book that we'll be hearing about tonight. We're conscious that through academic textbooks, we're not only serving the current generation of students, pastors, and thinkers, but we're also investing for future generations, as these valuable textbooks will serve students and pastors for many years to come. Some might ask why, as a publishing house, we bother publishing a book about Islam, why we, as a Christian publishing house, we we are publishing this book about Islam. For starters, let me start by saying that we believe that as Christians, our calling is not to live in a bubble or insular communities, and that our faith is not limited to a Sunday morning service only. Sunday morning service is very important. But our faith is not limited to that moment. It should permeate every aspect of our life. And as ambassadors of Christ, how can we relate? How can we love 
others who are around us from a different religion, if all that we have is a pitiful caricature or an image that we've inherited as we've, as we've heard tonight. Second, as Middle Eastern Christians are decreasing in number, and more so today because of the massive exodus that our country is witnessing, we believe, I believe, that the church of tomorrow will, not, will likely not be culturally Christian anymore as it is today, but most likely will be composed of people who are culturally from a Muslim background. And so my question to us, how can we share the gospel and integrate believers from a Muslim background if we don't know what they believe, if we don't know where they're coming from? And I've realized that I often shy from having deep conversations with my Muslim friends because of lack of knowledge and understanding. So we want to encourage you, our brothers and sisters, to reach out to our neighbors carrying a book, probably this book, rather than a baseball bat or a hammer. You know, the, the interesting thing about carrying a hammer, you start seeing nails everywhere. As Darman al Hayat, we also have many interesting resources in the pipeline, whether translated or through local authors. I'm going to name just a few. Uh, Historical Theology by Alistair McGrath is already out. Prophetic Imagination by Walter Brueggemann and Forgotten Ways by Alan Hirsch will be out this year. And in terms of local authors, we've published Imad Shahadi's series on Revelations, his seminal work on the Trinity, and his series on Evil and Suffering. Coming out this year in Arabic through, by Arabic authors is Philosophy of the Christian Religion by Hani Hanna and Arab Christian Theology by Wajih Yusuf. You know, we hope that our books that we publish are bricks in a bridge rather than bricks in a wall. And therefore, we encourage you to, uh, to purchase the, the book that is on display outside and uh, why not gift a book to your friends and neighbors? Thank you for coming here tonight, and we're looking forward to hear more about the content of the book uh, by Dr. Brown. Thank you. I would like to have this opportunity also to update you on our latest projects at ABTS, uh, again, in partnership and collaboration with Daman Hal Hayat as well. So currently we're working on this project, we are translating this very important series, NIC, called New International Commentary, New Testament and Old Testament. And this is a huge project, a very costly project. And actually, it's a leap of faith that ABTS is taking to translate this, because we believe that we have a huge need in the MENA to have a decent commentary uh, to serve the church, local pastors, leaders, theology students and seminaries as well. So this is the project that's coming up. We have now uh, in line Genesis. Genesis 1 to 17 will be out soon, and we will uh, let you know when it's out. Uh, we might have a book launch as well. And uh, Galatians as well. And the second volume uh, of Genesis and Psalms also. So, so we have four books now. Uh, it will take some time for the whole series to be out. But uh, we would appreciate your prayers, support for this project, because it's a very important project. And with this project, we will be serving the church and local seminaries as well in the MENA region. Thank you. Dr. Dan. Thank you very much. Um, I, I will uh, not give you the contents of the book. No, but you can do that yourself. Um, but what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the challenges of writing an overview of Islam. First of all, just to make it absolutely clear uh, that I did not write this with an explicitly Christian perspective at all. There are plenty of other books of that kind. This was intended to be a broad overview. And let me give you a brief history of how the book came about. It, it came about, actually, because I lost a job. Well, in part. I lost a job, and so I had extra time on my hands. And at the same time, I received a request via an academic friend 
uh, from Wiley publishers. They were interested in entering more into the field of Islamic studies. They were looking for someone who could write an overview of Islam. And so I, I decided this is good. I'll take, take this on. Uh, but because I didn't have a job, I had a certain freedom in terms of how I might approach it. I was not worried about what my colleagues would think. <laughs> I didn't have colleagues that I could worry about thinking. Uh, and uh, there were two things that I decided early on that were the impulses to behind uh, the way I would write the book. The first was that I had worked in a department of religion in an American college for a number of years. And in that department, I had noticed that Christianity and Judaism were taught in one way, and Islam was usually taught in a completely different way. In, when you studied Judaism and Christianity in a situation like this, you were exposed actually to some ra rather difficult and critical ideas uh, about the nature of texts, about the history of the Bible. Uh, and if you studied Islam, you were not. You know, there was a straightforward story uh, that you were told. And I thought, this is not actually good. Uh, it's not actually preparing even Muslim students to understand the ideas that are being debated in the field today. Uh, and so that was one of my impulses. The second impulse was that I really didn't want it to be boring. Now, whether I succeeded or not, the students who have had to uh, read it can tell you. Uh, but, I, but I really, you know, I, I wanted something that would actually make the story of Islam come across as interesting, as interesting as it really is. It really is an interesting story, as, as any story of a great human endeavor through history should be and, and is. So then the first question was how to start. You know, what, at what point do I start? And I, and I made, in the first edition, I made a decision um, that I, well, I think was still a good decision, but that nobody liked. I, I decided that the first chapter would be on the conquests, on the Arab conquests of the Near East, because it seemed to me that was a fixed point in history. Nobody could deny that conquests happened and that they changed the world. Right? They did, and they did change the world. But a lot before the conquest, we were quite uncertain about, especially the early sort of literary history of the Islamic tradition. And so I thought, starting there sends a message, right? This is the fixed point. Nobody got it. Nobody liked it, right? So I got lots of bad feedback on that. They made me change it in the second edition. But I still think I was right. Oh, well. The second question that I had to deal with was, how do you deal with this man whose name was John Wansbro? John Wansbro wrote two really influential books in the 1970s, Quranic Studies and the Sectarian Milieu. I was noticing that his second book, The Sectarian Milieu, is on Professor Akkad's bookshelf right next to The Gospel According to the Simpsons. I, I wondered if there was significance there. But nevertheless, these two books had an enormous impact in the field, but they were impossible to read. Right? I mean, they're, they're very Germanic in their prose, and so, you know, no, people were reading them or trying to read them and getting thoroughly confused. So, but nevertheless, they had a huge impact because of the questions and the challenges that he was making. So what do you do? Do you include that in a textbook or do you not? Most of my colleagues that wrote textbooks said, no, you know, it's, it's a little bit too much and it's sort of marginal. I decided yes, you know, that an ordinary student should be exposed to these ideas. Now... Over time, as I wrote subsequent editions, John Wansbro receded in importance a little bit for reasons unconnected with that, for reasons actually that go on to the next topic. When I, wrote, when I was revising for the third edition, uh, something interesting happened. The news about the Birmingham Quran fragment came out, and, and it made all the headlines. You know, the Birmingham Quran uh, was believed to be one of the earliest manuscripts that had been so far discovered. It was just hidden away in a library for a long time. And then the question arose, okay, this came out as I was doing this work. Do you include it? Do you not include it? You know, the conclusions haven't been drawn on this. Uh, and I decided, actually, that it raised new questions, especially about dating controversies, but it also called attention to how really interesting the whole story 
of Quranic studies in the modern period is. It's really a fascinating story. I mean, it's like a spy thriller, some of it. Uh, and so I rewrote that whole chapter on the Quran uh, because it just seemed so interesting to me. And so it needed an interesting treatment. Unfortunately, the other chapter that had to be rewritten, you could not say in any way that the subject was interesting. And that's the Hadith, right? The Hadith is my own study, my own subject of study, but nobody thinks study of Hadith is interesting. It isn't. I mean, a lot of it isn't because it's so arcane. So the big challenge there was, how do you talk about a really arcane subject in a way that does not shut people's eyes? So that was the first part of the book. How do you explain these difficult concepts? The end of the book was also one of the big challenges, especially the question, how do you prevent a textbook from becoming irrelevant within a few years? So for example, a few years ago, we were talking a lot about the Islamic State in Syria. We're not talking very much about the Islamic State in Syria now. If you did a whole chapter on the Islamic State, book's out of date, right? So what do you do in a situation like that? It seems so important right now. The decision I made was to focus on themes that seem to be enduring that it brought to light. For example, the importance of apocalyptic thinking in Islamic history. Or the importance and enduring importance of Salafism as a complex of attitudes. That was another problem that came up. How do we frame the history of Salafism? What is Salafism? For a long time, I had take, accepted the basic narrative that I had received, which was that we can trace Salafism back to Muhammad Abdu and Rashid Ridda. That didn't make a lot of sense to me. Unfortunately, I was saved by some scholarly work from 2010 or around there that called attention to the fact that, in fact, there was a different story of Salafism that could be told that was much more enlightening. Was I right to do so? I don't know. You know, I mean, there's lots of these questions. Was I right to include Wandsboro? Was I right to ask these other questions? But ultimately, that question came down to how safe should you play it when you're writing a textbook, right? How safe should you make it? Should you just put in what's the consensus, or should you take some risks and trust readers to ask the questions and to challenge? I chose to take some risks. Some of my colleagues don't like that choice and would have chosen differently. You can decide whether, you, whether I chose rightly or not. Or maybe Professor Akkad can tell you. I think you're on now. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dan, for uh, your entertaining presentation today and instructive and rich presentation. I'm less dramatic than you are in my public uh, presentation, <laughs> probably less effective as well. Um, you may wonder why we're talking about uh, the launch of an Arabic book in the English language, and you'd be right to wonder. But we decided to do it all in English and through translation so that uh, we have some consistency across the event. So I won't be discussing much the value of the Arabic translation, although I read through it a little bit and I think it's, a, it's an excellent rendering in the Arabic language. And so uh, I want to congratulate Darman al-Hayat for uh, doing this. My focus will be on the value of the book itself, A New Introduction to Islam, uh, in English, and therefore in Arabic. And so what I will say is about uh, what is specific to uh, Dan's approach and to this book, and uh, you can, uh, you can uh, apply these comments on the Arabic version uh, and uh, consider whether uh, it is worth your money. Uh, why, to begin with, why translate an introduction to Islam from English 
to Arabic. Wasn't Islam born in an Arab culture, in the Arabic language? And aren't most of the important source materials for the study of Islam in the Arabic language? Why do we need to translate an introduction to Islam written in English into Arabic? It's an interesting question that I've had to think about uh, for a while as someone who is a student of Islam and who tries to uh, help others to understand the tradition. As strange as this may sound, the fact is that we do not have an introduction to Islam written in Arabic by a Muslim scholar. But is it surprising? Do you know of Christians who write uh, an introduction to Christianity for the study of Christianity in a Christian seminary? There are exceptions. There are some examples just as I'm sure there are probably some equivalents in Arabic uh, in the Muslim tradition. But the fact is that Muslims don't study Islam by means of a book entitled Introduction to Islam, just as Christians don't study Christianity through a book entitled Introduction to Christianity. It takes a whole curriculum for Christian ministers to prepare for Christian ministry. And it takes a whole curriculum for Muslim clerics to prepare for Muslim ministry. You could recommend, for instance, to a Muslim to read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity as an introduction to Christianity, or Basic Christianity by John Stott, and um, many other examples. But, and that would help them get a good basic introductory level read on Christianity, but it would not make them experts in Christianity, just as reading an introduction to Islam is not going to make a Christian an expert on Islam. Just as in a basic introduction to Christianity, the reader will be introduced to the basic topics needed to understand the Christian faith, faith, so should a basic intro to Islam do. It's a blueprint, a roadmap to the worldview. And Dan Brown's introduction, like nearly every other introduction to Islam, offers first some historical and archaeological backgrounds to the emergence of Islam in Arabia. It then launches into the study of the person of Islam's prophet, Muhammad, to the Quran, to the hadith or traditions. It then has a historical section exploring Islam's early conquests, which, as we've heard today, Dan would have preferred to have as chapter one. And it speaks about the expansion of Islam into a vast empire. It discusses the concept of the caliphate, which is central in order to understand leadership, uh, philosophy, uh, and governance in Islam. In a third part, Brown explores three Islamic institutions, namely Islamic law, Sharia, Islamic theology and philosophy, and Sufism. And then in a fourth and final part, the book covers various periods of crisis and religious renewal. It uh, covers uh, the Crusader uh, wars, the Mongol invasions, later the Ottoman Empire, Western colonialism, Wahhabism, and then moves to the late colonial and post-colonial periods. Finally, the 20th century reform movement and all the turbulent transformations of that century and then the 21st century, century, all recent developments and enduring trends and movements within Islam. Dan Brown's new introduction to Islam will not make you an expert on Islam. Just as Stott's basic Christianity will not make a Muslim an expert on Christianity. But it will lay a solid foundation for the authentic and respectful study of Islam. 
And then in each chapter, you have a section entitled Further Readings. Uh, and this will offer valuable guidance for students wanting to engage in deeper study. Now a second part to uh, my reflection. There are literally dozens of options to choose from when it comes to introductions to Islam in the English language. Some would say hundreds. Why did we choose to translate this particular one into Arabic? Indeed, why do I, as someone who teaches Islam, like to use this particular introduction in my own teaching, whether at ABTS or at other, in other settings? I'll give you four reasons. First of all, Brown's new introduction to Islam presents an up-to-date approach to the study of Islam. Brown has updated his volume twice so far. He wrote the first in 2003, the second edition in 2009, and the third edition in 2017. Did you remember that? <laughs> So the edition uh, translated into Arabic by Dar Manhal al-Hayat is his third edition, the most recent, which mean that it, it means that it covers early 21st century developments after 9-11, as well as briefly the Arab Spring from 2011, and even the emergence of Daesh in the summer of 2014. The second reason why this intro rather than another is methodological. Brown's approach is methodological rather than simply descriptive or prescriptive. His style of writing is the sort that is accessible without being simplistic. Many introductions, by wanting to be accessible, end up being mostly descriptive. If they are geared toward Christians, they end up being largely comparative. You'll have comparisons of the Christian and Muslim views of God, Jesus, sin, salvation, etc. You won't find this in Dan's introduction. When I teach Islam at seminaries, I warn my students from the start, you will not learn from my class about the five pillars of Islam. Nor will I teach, nor will I tell you what the Quran says about Jesus or what Muslims teach about sin and salvation. I want students to learn how Islam functions rather than what Islam believes. By the end of my class, students should be able to write a research paper on almost any topic related to Islam, including Jesus, sin, and forgiveness by dealing with the Qur'an, the tafsir tradition, hadith, the seerah or biography of Muhammad, in a way that Muslims would recognize as legitimate, not in a way that is caricaturing Islam. Daniel Brown's new introduction helps me in taking this approach in the classroom. The third reason is his critical approach. In this characteristic, perhaps, Brown's new introduction is most new. It is new because he mentions John Wansbro, and uh, he is able to present the gist of the best of Western critical study in a more accessible way. A large proportion of introductions to Islam in the academia in the past have adopted mostly a traditional approach to the study of Islam. In the name of being academic, they have rightly adopted a non-polemical approach. But by doing so, many introductions end up being non-critical, simply embracing the traditional narrative of Islam about its own emergence. Dan Brown's intro is new in the sense that it brings in the outcome of some of the latest scientific critical studies about Islam in a respectful and solid academic way. 
This too I find very helpful in my own teaching of Islam as I consistently emphasize to my students that there is a big difference between a polemical and a scientifically critical approach to the study of Islam. You cannot be both polemical and respectful. Polemos in Greek means war. There is no respectful way of doing war. But critical, scientific, and respectful are all words that can describe the best and deepest of human relations. My fourth reason is faithfulness. Daniel Brown manages to integrate his own personal faith as a disciple of Jesus with a solid, respectful academic study of Islam. Now, as he has said, he approaches this book and his study without bringing in his own faith, and that is very true. His approach is quite unique. A new introduction to Islam contains no polemics, no apologetics, no preaching of Christianity as an alternative. Brown's personal faith is in no way obvious from reading the book only. His faith comes across through the respect he has for his topic, the fairness and balance of his approach, the commitment he shows to the importance of faith in and of itself. Concluding remarks. I'll close with a confession. I've been teaching Islam in the academy since 2001. Before I came across Dan Brown's new intro to Islam, I would use typically three textbooks in parallel, which I would get my students to read. One would be written by a Muslim scholar. Typically, I'd use Fazlur Rahman's Islam. And Dan studied under Faz Fazlur Rahman in the US for his PhD. I would then use one, one intro written by a secular, critical Western scholar. Typically, I've used Andrew Rippon. And one written by an evangelical scholar who has a personal faith and asks questions that I care about, which are, so what? Why should we know what we, are, what we are learning about Islam at a seminary? And so I've often used Colin Chapman's intro to Islam. Since I discovered Brown's new intro, I need only use this as my main textbook. I do also require them to read sections of other studies of Islam, but these are now to add perspectives on specific issues, not with the primary concern of giving them a balanced and well-rounded perspective on Islam, because I find enough of that in Dan's textbook. I'm extremely happy and enthusiastic that from now on, I'll be able to use the approach I have used with English-speaking speakers, uh, English-speaking students, with my Arab students when I teach in the Arabic language. I highly recommend this book, not only to those teaching and learning about Islam in the academy, but also to all the educated, faithful in our Arab churches who want to understand their Muslim neighbors better and in a way that is respectful and loving. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Darman Al Hayat, thank you, ABTS for partnering in this very important project.